Okay, um, it's great to be here. Um, so when I was a when I was a child, um, growing up in the 80s, like many people in Ireland and across the world, uh, I was blessed with a series of heroes. Um, and I did my utmost best to try to be those heroes. Ray Houghton was pretty easy, get a football, find a field, and it was pretty much after that I was whoever I wanted to be. Uh, Rambo and Batman presented certain challenges, but due to the local pawn shop, um, I could literally um, be as close as I could be. MacGyver, a little more difficult, you needed a garden shed, a sister willing to lock you in there with nothing but a blunt pen knife, a piece of chewing gum, and a bottle of water. And generally, he was able to get out of any situation. Unfortunately, I was not, and my sister had great um, laughter at my expense. But one of the particular heroes, and I, I, I forwarded to it, that I couldn't really get to was this guy called Robocop, because he was man and machine. He was completely optimized to do his particular job, which is to be a police officer. And whilst what's happening in the last uh, 15 years in the digital revolution is that um, things like this are becoming a reality. And as a child, no matter how much I tried, I could not become Robocop because I did not have a machine. Until about two months ago, when the guys in Dacry um, gave me an opportunity to get a little bit closer to my childhood dream. So the idea behind this is that man and machine can work perfectly well together, not as a competitive nature, but all, as an actual synergy between man and machine. And when we actually look at our evolution, that used to say, is our evolution really unique anymore? And so let's just begin that particular statement. Our evolution as humans and machines' evolutions as well. So let's just define the Internet of Things. And this is my own like, interpretation of what the Internet of Things is. There's many out there, lots of statistics, lots of hype. Um, but how I define it is applying algorithms to data from smart sensors that lead to process and life optimization. So the process piece is the industrial revolution around the industrial Internet. And the, the life is our own consumer IoT. So that's the wearables that have been mentioned in the last talk, and other forms of technology that are very close to us as humans. But if you actually take this concept and actually spin it into the world of humans, we actually do the exact same thing. In our, in our brains, we actually apply algorithms to data from sensors like our sight and our, our touch and our taste, and we actually leads to optimization of our lives and also the lives of our actual working, uh, working life. So let's just go back right to the beginning of time when there was an actual time on this earth where we had absolutely no humans. And consequently, there was a time where we didn't have computers to do things. And if we went up one stage further, even when there were humans, they weren't actually able to communicate. Likewise, we had devices on earth, and there was a time that we had no, they had no capability to communicate at all. New babies, that's my niece, uh, she kind of roped me into actually bring her into the deck, but new babies are being born every day, and consequently, we're actually producing more and more devices every day into our everyday environment. And as we go through human evolution, as we are children, we start to do pretty simple tasks, like check the fridge for milk. I'm sure there's many teenagers out there that still can't check the fridge for milk. And likewise, now we've decided we're sick of asking teenagers to check the fridge for milk, so we're going to get devices to do it. Pretty simple task to actually do that. As we progress again into the adult world, an adult learns how to drive a car. And it's a more complicated task. You can't expect a child to do it. And likewise, we're starting to see driverless cars appear in, in technology. So if you went back to 1995, humans and computers were completely separate. We used to have to go to a computer to check anything to do with the internet or anything like that. Now we're nearly the same thing. So if we look at humans, and technology and start to ask ourselves, what is the difference between humans and technology? And there's two pieces, and they're even being addressed. The first one is emotional intelligence. We're emotionally aware about situations around us, relationships with people and objects and environments that we have, and we're, we're, we have an incredible sense for being that type of intelligence. 
And you're even seeing in the technology world now that Google, for example, are actually pumping 2,865 romantic novels into their AI engine. And the whole purpose to this is to give it a heart. It wants, to, it wants its AI engine to be able to interpret this actual other emotion that we have. Now, that's 2,864 more romantic novels than I've ever read, because as a teenager in my grandparents' house, I read one. I was trying to understand the female uh, species, didn't really work out, and I kind of moved on. And the next piece is being context aware. So regardless of our emotion, as we move through society, we're very aware of the contexts that are associated with life. Like, why am I here? What am I doing here? How am I feeling? Who am I with? It's that type of being context aware that is still something that uh, technology is not actually mastered. It's trying, and a lot of companies are trying, but it's not got there. So one of the, the, the summations of this evolution is that it's not a threat from IoT. Humans and machines are not in some form of uh, competition. A story on that, I remember a couple of years ago, I was working in the area of computer vision, and we were building algorithms to check graphics. And the human operators in the production line were actually saying this was actually a threat to what we were trying to do. And I explained it wasn't, that we, it was actually going to be a kind of a two-way process. We built a classifier that could do 92% accuracy on detecting graphics. It wasn't good enough for the particular customer that we had. And we spent the bones of three weeks trying to optimize our classifier to, to make it more and more uh, accurate up towards 100%. At, at one point, though, I had, you know, a, bit of a kind of an idea with another guy, we were having a brainstorming session, and we discovered that we shouldn't ignore the elephant in the room. Humans are remarkably intelligent, and we actually brought the human into that um, actual particular algorithm, and we presented the result of the classifier to the human, and the human operator, and the operator was able to say yes or no. And when we combined the technology and the human, we received 100%, and uh, had no uh, returns or anything like that. So it was a remarkable, successful application in a very small sense in how humans and technology can work together. So just to, when we're thinking about the evolution and things like that, and that the threat of humans, uh, the threat of technology to humans, the number 12,000 plus, because I couldn't find it when I was checking this morning, that's the number of job titles in the world. Okay? So if you consider the start of evolution, there was one job title, survive. That was all. And when we went into the 19th century, there was probably, I found out, in the bones of five to 600 job titles. Now, a lot of those jobs are now gone because of the Industrial Revolution. And what's happening is every time a new form of technology comes on board, more and more jobs are being produced from technology. Has anyone any idea how many job titles are in the world that have the word electro at the front of them? It's actually in here. It's 120. There's 120 different job titles with Electro at the start of it. So it, that's what's going to happen. Technology will, in one way, retire jobs, but it's also going to create jobs. So this, this threatening is not there. So just a question to the audience. Is Uber an IoT application? So you would say no at the moment it's not, because you've actually got passengers connected with a cloud platform to drivers that are willing to take the passenger to a place. However, if you get to the context of driverless cars, that is a device. So then you're connecting people with devices, and it becomes an IoT application. So that is how the evolution will happen. Just to speak to some of the trends, um, business, and tech, uh, business and technology are going to become more and more interconnected. Um, that might sound like a common statement, but Technology people, engineers, software developers, are going to have to become more customer-centric. They're going to have to understand a certain amount about business. They're going to interlace. It's not going to be, there's, there's go, always going to be a rock star developers, but you're going to have to need, as you progress through your career, more of an understanding of your customers. Short story on, on this particular uh, trend. Um, back in 2010, I was playing a soccer match in Cork. Um, long story short, got my eye. Um, Blown, blown back by a football, and I tore my retina in four places. Had to go to rush to the hospital, surgery, and being a typical soccer player, um, I was more concerned about the results of the match than the actual, than the eye. Had surgery, was a success, but the, the doctor actually uh, put bandages over both eyes. He was saying that it would just cause pains, headaches. So for a period of a couple of days, I actually lost. Uh, I didn't have my sight available. So then what I actually started to notice that 
through some kind of, I suppose, not for any form of brain magic, but my senses, my other senses, became more intelligent and sort of com compensated by, for the vision. And something like that is going to have to happen in the technology over the next number of years. We are so reliant on personal devices and our eyes to get information from devices. Think about it. Every time we have a device in front of us, we're getting a notification. We're looking at the notification, we go back to our daily lives. It's all going through our eyes at the moment. Okay? So we're going to have to innovate more on the other senses to be able to absorb the amount of information from these connected devices. Data Geddon, this is coming. I mean, there's a lot of data being generated right now, and it's going to increase and continue to increase. And we can't just keep pumping data back to this concept of a cloud, right, in, in a data center. It's not very good for the environment. It's not very safe in a lot of ways as well from a personal privacy perspective. So just some two topics, and this is just my perspective on where things are going in relation to IoT, data science, and kind of computer architecture. This is going to be published in the dzone.com IoT guide uh, next month. Um, we need to become more unified in our view of compute for IoT. So you have devices, you have this concept of an edge gateway, and you have a concept then of a cloud. IoT applications are going to have to become more unified and have a certain amount of resources allocated and so that you, your IoT application can have a certain amount of compute allocated on the device at the edge in a gateway, for example, and then in the cloud. And the idea behind this is you can actually dynamically scale your unified compute model. And if you can do that based on your load, for example, if I, if for one hour every day, my actual wearable is very active, I will scale up my commute, and then I will scale it back down when I need to. And if I need to do anything off, off, off the device, I can do it uh, on the edge. So one of the application areas for this is what I'd like to call, it's actually cascading analytics. So analytics in the future, you can't have them static. At the moment, we're generally pulling a lot of static data back into an environment where we're actually doing a lot of processing on it, and that's not going to be the way it's going to be. You're going to have to be able to move analytics and move decision making closer to the device. And I'll have an example of that in relation to Tyco. In, in, in a couple of moments. So some of the advantages for IoT is you need to have an ethos. Okay? You need to have something to say, what am I actually trying to solve? You need three accesses. The first access you need is access to devices for IoT. The second one is data from those devices. And the third then is access to customers, which is the most important part. And the last part is partner. Co-creation is going to be the main enabler for IoT. No company, no one company on Earth, regardless of whether they believe it or not, is able to solve this entire IoT puzzle. So just to finish with a couple of slides on Tyco. Uh, Tyco is the largest fire and security company in the world. We specialize in saving lives, essentially. Uh, many different verticals, healthcare, retail, oil and gas, marine. Um, so many, many solutions. And Tyco has such a volume of sensors that have been literally been sitting there collecting data on site. And what we're actually trying to do now is build what's called Tyco One, which is the cloud platform. It's going to suck up the data and actually provide intelligent insight and business impact back to the customer. So our ethos, back to my original slide of advantages, is zero harm. So two minutes is the difference between saving a building and it burning to the ground. And that is where Tyco plays in, that two minutes. We're trying to save more lives by optimizing and detecting fire at an earlier point. Tyco has 3.5 billion installed sensors producing data every day. And we also have um, access within the company to One Albert Key in Cork. Um, we occupy four floors of this building in Cork now, and 65% of the technology in the building is actually Tyco equipment. So we've actually got access to all the data. So for, as an engineer, um, it's fantastic because it's actually like a, it's a test bed and it's actually a playground for us. We've accessed all this technology, but it's not just all about Tyco technology, right? We've, the other percentage of the building is actually made up of partner and third party technology and integrating that type of data as well is going to be critical. And we believe we can actually build applications that we can showcase to customers using this, this, this building. So when you're building IoT applications, like what we do in Tyco is we, we first of all ideate using what if. What if, we can do some, what if we can change the world through this, for example? And the second question is, who cares enough to actually pay for it? OK, this is the second piece. And then our whole concept, uh, an image has actually uh, disappeared. Oh, no, it's there. Sorry, it's just not as relevant down here. Um, we've 
we have this concept of the Tyco garage. So we've positioned garages globally, in, mainly in, in, in the Silicon Valley and also in Tel Aviv. And we have satellite ones in Florida, Cork, and Bangalore. And the whole concept is to think like a startup. So what we're actually trying to do is, instead of building products in segregation to customer development, we're keeping those loops really tight, very, very tight. So our product development and customer development are never too far apart. The last thing you want to do is race down your product development track and realize that your customer um, requirement is not being met by that. So we have to ensure you reduce the feedback loop between your product development and your customer development. And we believe this is the approach that will lead to building great IoT product. So just to kind of finish, and this is like, I kind of challenged myself to put this entire talk into 140 characters so I could actually send it out on Twitter. Um, it seems to be the metric for everything that we do these days. But it is innovation and IoT is all about us. It doesn't work without us. The design of its core comp uh, components, which is sensors and data science, are actually designed based on us. And it will actually evolve like us. Um, thank you very much. You can reach me on Twitter, my handle, and on my blog. And on behalf of myself and Tycho, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.